Hey there, camels. Uh, today I want to talk about OCaml's subtyping relation. So this, in, in contrast to many of the other videos I've made, this is not about something specific to Jane Street, but rather a feature of OCaml that's maybe a little bit obscure um, uh, that I want to explore for, I think, two videos. And then we'll go on to talk about immutable arrays, which is something specific to Jane Street. But um, one of the cool features of immutable arrays has to do with this subtyping relation. So I thought I'd start here. Um, so once again, this is totally sort of normal OCaml. Um, and, and you can use you know, any OCaml compiler. This, has been, this feature has been around for a little while. Um, the, the starting point for this is to recognize that some types in OCaml really have a, sort of a subset of the values of, of other types. So let's look at, I'm specifically thinking about polymorphic variants. Um, so if I have types foo and bar, which will look, whoops, which will look like this. Well, what this says, this first type, this is a pretty boring type, right? This says that every value of type foo is just the application of this nullary constructor foo. Um, and then foo bar is the same, but also these things could be bars. Um, but that means that everything that's a foo is also a foo bar. And indeed, the language sort of is aware of this fact. So I can write a function f that looks like this, and use a slightly strange syntax. There it is. Um, and just to show you that this works, I can compile this, everything is happy. What's going on? And, and indeed, we see down here that the type of f goes from foo to foo bar. Um, so this, uh, this expression here says that x has type foo, but we want it to have type foo bar. And so this causes OCaml to do a little check. Is every value of foo also a legal value of foo bar? If it is, then this will type check, and the type of this whole expression will be this foo bar piece. Um, it's worth saying that we don't always need to specify this first part if we know it somehow some other way. So I know x is foo over here, then I can just write this, and that should work um, uh, just fine. So I'm gonna I'm gonna prefer this first sort of fully explicit notation um, uh, just to, so that it's always very clear exactly what we're doing. But in practice, most programmers will just use it like this. Um, and, and again, this is it. This is not user definable or anything. This is sort of a special subtyping operator or coercion operator uh, that's that's part of OCaml. Um, okay, so let's get rid of G here. And uh, so I said, what this is doing is this is checking that every value of type foo is also a value of type foo bar. So this works for these definitions, but not any definition. If I say that my my foo also carries an int up here. Well, now we have a problem, and it says that foo of int is not a subtype of this other one that, that has a foo that doesn't take a constructor. Um, it says the first variant type does not allow tag bar. That, actually, that's a bug in the compiler right here because that's not the problem. This, this state, the sentence is true, but that doesn't stop the subtyping relation. Um, really, the problem is, is that there's this int. Right. If I whoops, if I re-add the int to the other one, now all will be well again. Right. Because every value of type foo is also a value of type foo bar. Um, okay. So that's that's kind of a simple case. Um, things can get a little bit more complicated in that what we can have is I can make these recursive, and now it's a little harder to think about. Does that work? And it turns out that it does. Right. Because we can apply this subtype relation recursively. Here, I know that foo is a subtype of foo bar. And so here, if I have a value uh, foo that, that contains sort of a, whoops, uh, what have I done? I've done something terrible. Uh, there we go. Um, uh, that, that contains this sort of recursive use of foo, that's still going to be OK. So we're, we're starting to see that this subtyping relation is a little bit more powerful than maybe other conversion techniques when it can, when it can look deeply through types like this. We can also do fun things like this. That works too. So if I have a list of foos, then I can make a foobar list. And now this is, this is very interesting um, because normally to do a conversion like this, I have to do some kind of runtime operation and reallocate the whole list and walk down the list. And, and if I have a big list, this might take time. This coercion operator, on the other hand, is always guaranteed to be free at runtime. So uh, this will this this actually does nothing. All this does is a little bit of type checking. 
Um, and indeed, it changes the type, and that's that type checking is preserved and can be used in other functions. Um, uh, but this will never cause any impact at runtime. So we know that it's always going to be efficient. Um, okay, so um, so far so good. There's one other part of this subtyping operator that I want to talk about today, and that's its relationship to private abbreviations. So let me write a little example here. Um, so let me write it out, and then we will discuss. Okay, so here we are. Um, and what's going on here is that, uh, well, what I want to say here is that t is really just an int, but I might want to have extra invariants on t. Um, so actually, maybe, maybe we'll even impose these invariants. Something like, if x is greater than 0, then x, else, uh, you know, raise invalid arg. Is that the right syntax? Oh, um, oh it's invalid argument. Um, so raise, I don't know, something like this. Okay. So, so now, now we, we've actually created a t, and so we can state that there is an invariant. T is positive, I did. Okay, um, and the fact that I've written private here means that I can't confuse T and int. If I just say type T equals int, well, then, um, then I can just sort of use T as int, use int as T. There's no way of maintaining an invariant over that. With this private, it, it allows me to say that t is distinct from it, int, yet still represented as an int. So let's, let's see this in practice here. So um, what I can do is if I say let f, if I have x is t, and then if I want to return an int and just say equals x, that's no good. Oh, unbound, oh, I have to say m dot t. Um, uh, okay, so an expression has type m dot t, but was expected of type int. That's not really a surprise. If I do it the other way, then I get a similar behavior. Um, that's no good. These are two different types. Um, yet, what this private allows me to do is always extract the int out from the t using a coercion. So using the syntax that we wrote before, I can say that x it really has type m dot t, but we want it to have type int. And that's now accepted. And so one, you know, an alternative to this, of course, is just creating another function like muck here that then unwraps it and, get, and gets us the int. But this, as we saw earlier, this coercion thing works under lists. So now I've done something kind of cool here in that if I have a list of t's, I can just turn that into a list of ints with no action needed at runtime. So that's quite nice, and that's only allowed using this private. It doesn't work the other way, because then that would sort of violate our idea that we might have an invariant. Um, so just to, to show that, if I start with int and try to convert to m dot t, then we get type int is not a subtype of m dot t. And, and that, that is what we want, right? This would give us sort of a way of cheating and a way of creating m dot t's that, um, that don't satisfy the invariant. We want to be able to control construction of t's, but not really con con control destruction or elimination of t's. Um, and so this is just another use of this same coercion operator that, that works outside of the context of polymorphic variants. It also works with object types, but object types tend to get sort of big and complicated, and I think would take us too far afield here. Um, anyway, I hope this has been interesting. Next time, we're going to talk about how this um, uh, coercion operator interacts with uh, variance annotations when we're defining new data types. So long.